To this day, Devil May Cry 3 is one of the greatest comeback stories in gaming history. Not only did it fix the colossal missteps of its predecessor, but it also introduced plenty of new ideas that pushed the series forward, with the most notable being the multitude of different combat styles, on-the-fly weapon switching, and the full realization of jump cancelling. All of these mechanics were wrapped up in the reworked combat ranking system that encouraged players to always be pushing their skills to their absolute limits. Devil May Cry 3 proved that the series was more than just a one-hit wonder, and is what I consider to be one of the greatest action games on the PlayStation 2. Because of DMC3's massive success, fans had high expectations for the next game, not just because they were clamoring for more of what the last game provided, but because this would mark Devil May Cry's debut on the seventh generation of consoles, which was a huge deal. Of course, this meant that we would see a bump in graphical quality, but the new hardware would also allow the developers to do things that weren't possible back on the PS2 gameplay-wise. The excitement surrounding DMC4 was through the roof, and in early 2008 we finally got our hands on it. Critically speaking, the game reviewed rather well, and was the best-selling game in the series for the longest time. However, as time has gone on, I don't really see many people talking about this game much anymore. While you might assume that this is because DMC5 is still a hot ticket item, but that's not exactly the case since the nearly 20 year old DMC3 is still fondly remembered and talked about to this very day. Most of the discussion surrounding Devil May Cry 4 nowadays is focused on its somewhat troubled development, and how it had an impact on the game's overall quality. Believe me, I'm going to be going into a bit more detail on this subject later on, since there's a lot to unpack. So for today's video, I'm going to be taking a thorough look at Devil May Cry 4, both in the context of its release and how it stacks up to other games in the genre nearly 15 years later. Just like with the last game, Devil May Cry 4 would eventually see an updated re-release subtitled Special Edition. This version of the game saw quite a bit of tweaks and improvements, such as allowing console players to experience Turbo Mode, the addition of a few extra difficulty options, some new costumes, and most importantly of all, the inclusion of a few extra playable characters. Those being being Dante's demon hunting partner Trish, Devil May Cry 3's Lady, and of course, Dante's older brother Virgil. DMC4 Special Edition is easily the best version of the game, and is the one I'm going to be using for the basis of this video. The original version is more than playable, but Special Edition just blows it out of the water. Technically speaking, there is a third version of this game called Devil May Cry 4 Refrain. It was a heavily stripped down version of DMC4 released back in 2011 for iOS and Android. Super ambitious for the time, but like, like, who cares? It's not like you can even play it if you wanted to, since it's been delisted from the App Store. I only mention it so I don't have any comments telling me that I missed this integral piece of Devil May Cry lore. Anyways, just like always, there are going to be spoilers throughout this video for DMC4. Not that this means much anyway, since the story here is kind of lacking. Don't get me wrong, it's not terrible, but it's a huge step back from DMC3. But first, I'd like to tell you about today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community packed to the brim with inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity. Skillshare's classes are for creative and curious people on topics ranging from graphic design, video, illustration, freelancing, photography, and many more. No matter the interest, Skillshare provides the tools necessary to help you take the next step forward in your creative journey. For this month, I recommend How to Speak Confidently on Camera, a guide for content creators by Nathaniel Drew. One of the most important skills to have when building an online career is being able to speak comfortably in front of the camera, or in my case, a microphone. Not only does this lend your work a sense of professionalism, but it also adds a layer of authenticity, which helps make your words feel more raw and honest. Mr. Drew's class is great for those looking to hone those skills, as he not only offers plenty of useful tips and exercises to help you improve, but he also goes over his own personal journey and highlights what he's learned over the years. Confidence is a good thing to have, and I highly recommend anyone interested to check out this course. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, since Skillshare is constantly launching brand new classes, so there's always something new to discover. All of which is ad-free and can be easily slotted into anyone's schedule. What's also great is that they're doing a special offer right now. The first 1,000 people to click the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare, so you can immediately go and start exploring your creativity. Once again, a major thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. DMC4 breaks series tradition because rather than focusing on Dante, we follow a new protagonist instead. Meet Nero, a human-demon hybrid who works for an organization known as the Order of the Sword. They're essentially a religion that formed around the Dark Knight Sparta, and they worship him as their god. Notable members of the group include the General of the Holy Knights and Nero's adoptive brother Kratos, Nero's girlfriend Kyrie, the chief alchemist Agnes, 
And finally, the ruler of the group, Sanctus. During a sermon surrounding Sparta, a familiar devil hunter suddenly bursts into the scene and assassinates Sanctus. Before Dante can make quick work of the other members, Nero steps in and fends off the attacker, giving the people enough time to evacuate. Nero is unable to detain Dante, but before he takes his leave, he reveals to the young man that the members of the order he killed were actually demons. Wanting to get to the bottom of this mystery while also avenging their leader, Nero is sent on a mission to locate and capture Dante, while also taking down any demons he comes across. That's the basic setup to DMC4, and as I said, I find it to be very interesting. The story of this game was meant to cater to new players, while also offering something unique for already existing fans, and I think that the idea of casting Dante as the game's initial antagonist is great. For the past few games, we've gotten to see what Dante's work looks like from his perspective, but DMC4 is unique in the sense that we get an outsider's point of view on these events. While the audience knows that Dante isn't a bad guy and doesn't act without a reason, the same can't be said about the characters in-universe. All they know is that this madman just killed off an important figurehead and believes that he should be brought to justice. Not only does this opening establish Nero's character motivations for this story, but it also hints that something fishy is going on with the Order of the Sword that our protagonist is unaware of. Most of the story from here on out focuses on Nero's journey to locate Dante, while also slowly uncovering the truth behind the Order's operations. But let's put a pin in this discussion for now and talk about Nero himself for a second. On the surface, Nero might not seem all too different from Dante. While it's true that Nero was cut from the same basic template, I think that there are enough differences in his characterization to make him stand out. If Dante was inspired by the typical 80s action hero, then Nero is more so representative of a punk from the early 2000s. Not so much in his character design, but more so in his attitude. Dante is a very laid-back and carefree guy. He loves to show off and is very sociable. In contrast, Nero is a bit of a loner. He's standoffish towards the figureheads of the Order and can be prone to letting his emotions get the better of him, which ends up landing him in hot water in a few different cases. While these two have very distinct characterizations, the issue with Nero is that he doesn't go through much personal growth and ends up being a more typical shonen protagonist at the end of the day, which is a bit disappointing, especially compared to Dante's character in DMC3. That game was centered around the themes of family and the importance of responsibility, so a lot of effort was put into Dante's character arc to reflect those core ideas. I can't say the same things about Nero in DMC4, since the game doesn't bother to present us with a personal conflict. The closest we get is his eventual defection from the Order of the Sword, but I don't think that the idea was used to its fullest potential. It's immediately established that Nero didn't care much at all about his faith, and is more so working with the group because his adoptive family is associated with them. I I get that they wanted to use this game to establish Nero's character more than anything, but I find that this results in a bit of an underwhelming interpretation. I don't find Nero to be a bad character, mind you. I think he could be pretty entertaining to watch, but much like a lot of people, I prefer Dante. While it might seem as though Dante takes a step back for this adventure, that's not entirely the case. Throughout the game, we learn that the Order of the Sword isn't the innocent group that they were initially made out to be. We see that Agnes has been using Virgil's Yamato to open up the gates of hell to summon demons. By harvesting enough demons, the Order plans on giving themselves demonic forms, with the previously thought dead Sanctus being the one leading the operation. The Order also plans on using this giant living statue known as the Savior to achieve world domination. While Nero attempts to take down Sanctus then and there, he ultimately proves unsuccessful and ends up being absorbed by the demon. With Nero temporarily out of the picture, it's up to Dante to step in and clean up this mess. The second half of the game is spent entirely with Dante, and while it's great to see him in action again, unfortunately, this is when the story starts to lose its steam. From Mission 11 up until the end of Mission 18, there's next to no meaningful story content. Sure, we're given some extra context as to why Dante is even involved with the happenings in Fortuna to begin with, and we're also shown what Lady and Trish have been up to, but other than that, nothing really happens. It's still fun to watch watch Dante interact with the demons he comes across. I like that his personality is a compromise of his more stoic portrayal in the first game, while also including his energetic tendencies from DMC3. Part of me also likes how disgustingly overpowered they portray Dante as. You see all this crazy shit going down, but to Dante, it's just another day in the office. 
This part of the game's narrative feels very disjointed, and the ending just sort of sneaks up on you. Everything is resolved in the span of a few missions, and it isn't nearly as satisfying or as emotional as the final act of DMC3. And that's the best way I can surmise this story. The story of DMC4 is a step back in most regards, and while this on its own doesn't make it a terrible or even bad story, it's ultimately disappointing. The last game showed that the Devil May Cry series was capable of telling stories that could contain tangible themes and some surprisingly nuanced characters. The relationship between Dante and Virgil was the cornerstone of all of this. It was the emotional core of that story, and even if you didn't pick up on all of the subtleties in their interactions, the rivalry the two shared was enough to keep things interesting. DMC4, on the other hand, doesn't have much going for it beyond some fun character interactions. And hey, for some people, that's more than enough. But I find the story to be a bit on the weak side. It does an okay job at establishing Nero as a character, presents some cool concepts such as the religion surrounding Sparta, and very briefly talks about the nature of humans and demons. Great ideas that unfortunately don't get the attention necessary for them to be fully fleshed out. But this is just one of the aspects that are unfortunately undercooked due to time constraints. Yeah, the story is kind of lame, but it's not the main appeal. How does DMC4 stack up in terms of gameplay? A lot of the core gameplay elements introduced in the last game have made their way here. So for the sake of time, I'm mostly going to cover the new ideas and changes introduced in DMC4. Let's start off simple and cover Nero first. I mentioned in the story section that Nero was introduced as a way to welcome newcomers to the series, and this philosophy is carried over into his gameplay design. Nero's core moveset is rather simplistic on the outside. Unlike Dante, Nero doesn't get any alternate combat styles, and only has access to one gun and one sword. Some key differences right off the bat is that Nero has a lot more options while in the air. On top of having a basic 3-hit air combo, there's also an alternate combo if you wait a moment in between button presses, and a special flying slash that you can use to quickly close the gap on an airborne enemy. On the ground, Nero has three combos, a slightly different take on the stinger ability, and a shuffle attack that can be used to quickly dodge an enemy before returning with a powerful blow. Nero's gun, the Blue Rose, also has some substantial differences. Aside from its standard firing mode, there's also a charge shot. By holding down the fire button, you'll begin to build up power in your gun. The longer you charge, the more powerful the results. A fully charged Blue Rose bullet is very powerful, and comes with a delayed explosion effect that you can use to weave into combos with proper timing. Nero's charge shot is a staple of his kit, and is the sole reason as to why you should remap the fire button to the right trigger when playing as him. This makes it so you can charge up his gun while performing other actions. Another staple mechanic of Nero is his Exceed Gauge. By pressing the left trigger, Nero can rev up his sword, and with enough button presses, one of the segments will be filled. This provides the player with a couple of benefits. Not only do your melee attacks come out faster and deal more damage, but certain attacks will also have their properties changed. For example, Nero's streak move goes from a single sweeping slash to a series of spin attacks. This mechanic might not seem too useful at first due to the time it takes to charge up the rev gauge, but there is a workaround to this. By pulling the trigger at the right time during an attack, you'll be rewarded with one exceed bar. Do this with frame perfect timing and all three bars will be instantly filled. Maxing out the rev meter on attacks is extremely difficult and requires hours of practice, but the payoff is well worth it since the moves you can pull off are both deadly and satisfying to use. My timing on the max exceed is pretty bad, but I've gotten enough practice to at least get a regular exceed charge somewhat consistently. The charge shot and exceed gauge are the bread and butter of Nero's combat. You've gotta get used to not only holding down the right trigger constantly, but you also need to nail the rev timing on his sword swings, which is a lot easier said than done. However, Nero's most defining character trait is his demonic arm, which can be used in combat in a few different ways. By pressing the circle button when next to an enemy, Nero will be able to perform a grab. This works against every enemy enemy in the game, including bosses. Certain projectiles can also be thrown back at enemies with proper timing. While throws look really cool, the game takes certain measures to keep them from being exploited. For starters, using throws too liberally will cause your style meter to quickly decrease. And aside from your standard punching bag demons, most enemies can only be thrown after making them vulnerable. This, combined with their quick and brutal animations, makes throws something that you should usually save for the end of a combo. Another benefit to the Devil Bringer is that it allows you to snatch enemies from a distance and bring them towards you, but if the demon in question is too heavy, you'll instead pull yourself towards them. 
The Devil Bringer is such a great mechanic. Not only is it a fun and unique tool to play around with, but it also serves a purpose in exemplifying Nero's more aggressive personality. Nero has a unique grab animation for nearly every enemy in the game, with each one getting more brutal than the last. It's a reward for finding holes in the enemy's defense, and I'll never get tired of seeing the ways Nero can just lay the smack down on some of these guys. That's not all for Nero since he also has his own Devil Trigger to take into account. Of course, he gets some of the standard benefits such as health regeneration and boost attack power, but it also comes with some of its own unique quirks for you to consider. Nero's DT essentially doubles his DPS, since his astral projection mimics every attack. Not only that, but all of his grabs deal more damage and come with altered animations to reflect his demonic power. Nero's gun attacks are also altered, since he summons flying blades with each shot fired, with the number of blades increasing if it was a charge shot. One of the more novel aspects of Nero's Devil Trigger is its two exclusive moves you can perform, which I personally didn't use all too much, since I thought their damage output was a bit too low for the commitment needed to charge them up. It's a cool idea, and I can imagine some people getting some use out of it, but it wasn't really something that I experimented with myself. When looking at all the tools at Nero's disposal, it's easy to see that his character was designed around a hyper-aggressive playstyle. You're meant to always be in the enemy's face, and you're given the tools necessary to make that a possibility. However, it's up to the player and their skill to keep up the flow in battle. Nero has a very accessible kit since not much effort is required in executing his commands, and nearly all of his melee attacks are variations on a select few inputs. He's a pretty easy character to understand, but that doesn't mean he lacks any sort of depth. Mastering Nero's playstyle requires you to know how to properly use his charge shot, learning the correct timings on his exceed gauge, and how to effectively use his devil trigger to cancel attack animations. There's a decent skill ceiling to this character, and while Nero is fun to play as, his general combat style honestly gets a little stale after a while. Sure, Nero has a healthy selection of skills for you to use and some fun mechanics to play around with, the downside is that there isn't much in his arsenal that can be used to change up your playstyle. While there are a few different moves for you to work into your combos, at the end of the day, it can be pretty easy to fall back on a specific combo route without much variety. The sheer spectacle of Nero's attacks provides enough of a satisfying feedback to carry his gameplay for a while, but he feels like he's missing something to keep me coming back to him. With the way he is now, I only pick Nero if I'm itching for what he can specifically provide. He serves his purpose of being an introductory character rather well, but maybe he could have benefited with a few extra meaningful moves to spice things up. Once again, I'm not saying Nero has no depth, far from it, but I personally find his gameplay style to be inherently limited. However, if you're not a huge fan of Nero's more straight-to-the-point design and are looking for something a bit more varied, then man does Dante got you covered. Dante in DMC4 takes the foundation late in the last game and turns it up to an 11. Just like last time, Dante's core gameplay revolves around his different combat styles and on-the-fly weapon switching. So, what exactly does Dante have at his disposal? Well, let's run down the list real quick. The four basic combat styles from DMC3 have made their return. Trickster style gives Dante some extra movement options. Swordmaster gives every melee weapon a secondary attack command. Gunslinger is the same as Swordmaster, but for firearms. And Royal Guard grants Dante with defensive abilities. New to Devil May Cry 4 is the Dark Slayer style. This style lets you use Yamato to perform some powerful attacks and even gives you access to Virgil's Judgment Cut. It's a super cool style, though unlike the other four, it sadly can't be leveled up. Most of the weapons Dante has leans on the familiar side if you played the other games. There's his trademark Sword Rebellion, the charge-based gauntlet weapon Gilgamesh, his dual pistols Ebony and Ivory, and of course he has his sawed-off shotgun, the Coyote A. It's the same stuff fans are used to seeing at this point, but DMC4 does introduce two new weapons to the table. What's special about these weapons is that they lean a bit more on the unconventional side. For starters, we have Lucifer. This weapon allows you to place spikes on the air as well as stick them to enemies. Usually they'll explode after a couple of seconds, but can be detonated manually with the chuck of a rose. This rose actually doubles as an attack, believe it or not. And with enough ingenuity, you can actually use it to propel enemies further into the air. Or if you're feeling really cheeky, then you can use it to land a killing blow. Lucifer is such an interesting weapon. For the longest time, I never bothered to use it though. I thought it was too gimmicky and figured I'd be better off sticking exclusively to the other two weapons. But as time has gone on, I've grown to appreciate Lucifer and the unique playstyle that comes along with it. It's very satisfying to stick a bunch of spikes in an enemy, switch to another weapon, and then end the combo by detonating the explosives. Its inherently silly nature also fits perfectly with Dante's carefree and confident attitude. The other new weapon introduced in DMC4 is Pandora. This weapon is essentially the firearm equivalent to a Swiss Army knife. Pandora can transform into different weapons depending on the actions you perform. 
For example, using Pandora in the air will transform it into a minigun, and it'll become a rocket launcher while on the ground. Pandora's main gimmick is the disaster gauge. Whenever you land one of Pandora's attacks on the enemy, this purple meter under your health bar will fill up. You can then spend this meter while in Gunslinger style to activate even more powerful attacks. Pandora is probably my favorite gun in the franchise. It's one of the few firearms that has more going for it other than just dealing ranged damage, and it's a shame that this is the only game to feature it. That about covers all the tools Dante has at his disposal. On the outside, it might seem like a bit of a downgrade from last time. However, DMC4 makes up for this lack of quantity thanks to one major addition to the gameplay that completely redefines the combat system. Instead of being limited to one style and four weapons, Dante now has access to all five styles and all six weapons at the same time. By pressing any direction on the D-pad, Dante will change to the corresponding style, with the sole exception being Dark Slayer style, which is accessed by pressing the same direction twice. Weapon switching is done in the same way as previously, but you now have three guns and three melee weapons to switch to. The best part about all of this is that style and weapon switching is near instant, meaning that it can be worked into your combos with enough skill. Because you have access to Dante's entire arsenal at once, there's nearly no limit to what can be done with this character. You can use Trickster Style to teleport in front of an airborne enemy, switch to Swordmaster to perform an aerial combo, then end it off by switching to Gunslinger Style to perform Rainstorm. If you really want to get crazy, you can also integrate mid-combo weapon switching into the mix. There's truly no correct way to play as this character, since you can quickly adapt to any scenario presented. Enemies are like your canvas, the weapons your paint, and Dante is your brush. You can do anything you want with those ingredients. You can play this game in a somewhat similar fashion to DMC3 if that's what you desire, but I think that's doing the mechanics a bit of a disservice. The game wants you to push your skills to their absolute limits and use everything you have at your disposal to craft unique and visually stunning combos. However, this brand new sense of freedom does come with a steep price. Dante from DMC4 was undoubtedly one of, if not, the most complex action game character of the time. The sheer number of options and different ways they could be used meant that people who were in it for the long haul always had something interesting to work into their playstyle. But the thing is, Dante's complexity might actually be one of his greatest weaknesses. Now, what exactly do I mean by this? Dante's near limitless skill ceiling is a great thing to have, but it comes at the cost of making him a really fucking intimidating character to pick up. I'm not gonna beat around the bush. Dante has a really steep learning curve, especially if DMC4 was someone's first game in the series. The gap in complexity and difficulty between Nero and Dante is massive, and the game doesn't do a good job at preparing new players for it. While it's true that Dante doesn't start off with all of his equipment, he still has a lot of options for you to consider, and that's not even counting the proud souls that transfer over for upgrades. This wasn't an issue in DMC3, since that game had inherent limits on what you could have equipped during a mission. Now that these restrictions are completely off the table, someone just picking up Dante might be so overwhelmed with options that they end up sticking to one specific playstyle and are too intimidated to experiment. This problem only worsens as you unlock even more weapons and styles. In a way, this can be seen as a failure, since DMC4 was meant to be an entry point, as it was the first game in the series to be released on multiple platforms. However, if you're willing to put in the time and effort it takes to get used to Dante's playstyle, then you'll be in for one of the deepest and most satisfying combat systems you can find. If we were to just look at Devil May Cry 4 from a mechanical standpoint, then I think it's easy to see that this game completely one-ups its predecessor in almost every way. However, where DMC4 ends up faltering a bit is in the aspects surrounding its combat system, to the point where it could be argued that it overpowers the fantastic mechanics and drags the entire experience down. Let's start off simple and talk about how upgrades work. In previous DMC games, red orbs could be used to purchase new abilities for your weapons. However, red orbs could also be used to buy other items in the shop, such as blue orbs to increase your health, purple orbs to increase your devil trigger gauge, or even some one-time use healing items. Because everything shared a universal currency, you were presented with an interesting choice. You could either add new moves to your arsenal, or if you weren't feeling confident, you could get yourself a bit of a safety net. The red orbs also encourage you to perform well in combat, since if you had a high style ranking, enemies would give better orb payouts. This was a great idea, but for some reason or another, DMC4 changed the system and ended up making it worse. A new currency was introduced to the shop called Proud Souls. These are awarded to the player at the end of a mission, and your payout is determined by your end stage rank. Proud Souls can only be used to buy upgrades, and Red Orbs are now exclusively used to buy items in the shop. 
Not only does this remove interesting decision making, but you get far more red orbs than you do proud souls, which means that your upgrade selection is rather limited for your first playthrough. The worst part about this system, however, is that the price of upgrades scales with each one you buy, making it take even longer to get all the upgrades. I'm also not a huge fan of some of the abilities featured in the store, and believe that they should have been unlocked by default. Why the hell do I have to buy enemy step? What's even worse is that it's so goddamn expensive, and only rises in price if you decide to buy anything else in the meantime. Not a huge fan of Proud Souls, and I'm glad that this is the only game to use this system. One of the more contentious aspects of this game is its enemy selection and stage design. A lot of people cite DMC4 as having the worst enemy roster in the entire series. I often hear people say that the enemies were only designed with Nero in mind, so fighting them as Dante isn't nearly as fun. I don't really agree with this. In all honesty, I actually find it to be an improvement over the last game. A bit of an unpopular opinion, I know, but I just find that there's more enemies that I enjoy fighting in DMC4 compared to 3. But I think that this mostly has to do with just how much time I've put into this game as a whole. Every enemy in the game, no matter how difficult they might look on the outside, comes with a trick to quickly take them down. Let's use the Blitz as an example since he's one of the more infamous demons in the game. Usually you can't deal damage to the Blitz unless you shoot it enough times for his electricity to disperse. This is no problem for Nero since his charge shot makes quick work of his barrier, but since Dante's guns aren't nearly as powerful as Nero's charge shot, it takes much longer for him. However, if you time it right, you can Royal Guard after every hit on the Blitz to absorb the kickback you usually get. Not only does this deal damage to the demon, but it fills up both your Devil Trigger Gauge and your Royal Guard Meter. Tricks like this exist all throughout the game if you're willing to experiment, but that doesn't mean that DMC4 is free from annoying enemies, because when there's a bad demon, god it's bad. The Chimeras especially aren't fun to fight. You're in the middle of pulling off a sick combo only for you to suddenly take damage because it can still attack while in hit stun. Annoying, yes, but it still isn't on the level as something like the Soul Eaters or the Fallen from DMC3. However, something that game does undoubtedly better are the boss battles. On top of having more bosses, they were just better overall fights due to having more complex moves at their disposal. The ones from DMC4 are fine, but they're a lot more forgettable and go down far too quickly. Something that I appreciate about the level design of DMC4 is that it tries to be a bit more involved. This is usually done through the inclusion of light platforming and puzzle solving. The execution on this is a bit of a mixed bag, however. Sure, during a first time playthrough, these sections can serve as a nice break between the constant action, but with every subsequent run through the campaign, these gimmicks start to lose their luster and become more annoying than anything. The dice game is especially guilty of this. It's not a hard challenge at all once you figure out the trick to getting consistent rolls, but the pacing comes to a screeching halt during this segment. Since we're on the topic of level design, I should address the elephant in the room. Devil May Cry 4, for all of its fantastic gameplay and mechanics, suffers from one major issue that plagues the entire experience. Simply put, the game's unfinished. Dante has no levels or bosses he can call his own, and the last half of the game is spent backtracking through Nero's stages. Sure, there's one or two new enemies sprinkled in, but other than that, these missions are identical to their first visits. You even have to refight the same bosses as before, and none of them saw any sort of changes to keep them fresh. The second to last mission even sees you fighting the same bosses again for a third time. The only piece of original content Dante gets to experience is his boss battle against the Savior, which isn't very good. While it is true that Dante is an incredibly fun character to play as and offers a lot of depth, it doesn't make up for the fact that DMC4 is only half a game. It's not like playing as Virgil in DMC3 where the reused content can be excused. That game already featured a fully fleshed out campaign, and Virgil's story acted more so as a bonus. DMC4 on the other hand forces you to play through the same missions twice just to reach the ending, and it's easily the most infamous aspect of the game. And this issue is only compounded in Special Edition. As I mentioned at the start of this video, DMC4 Special Edition included a couple of new playable characters for us to sink our teeth into. Of course Best Boy Virgil made a comeback, but Lady and Trish were also added to the game. I don't want to spend too much time on them since the video is already long enough as is, and there honestly isn't that much to say about these characters. Virgil is basically a souped up version of his DMC3 counterpart. You have access to the same three weapons as last time, but his moveset has been greatly expanded. One of the more notable additions is the perfect judgment cut mechanic. By holding down and releasing the attack button at specific points during the animation, Virgil will instantly perform a stronger version of his judgment cuts. The timing is somewhat strict, but the payoff is well worth it. 
Funnily enough, this mechanic is actually a carryover from a similar one featured in the Virgil DLC from DMC Devil May Cry, though you probably don't remember since it's DMC Devil May Cry. Another new mechanic to Virgil's kit is his concentration meter. By consistently landing attacks without taking damage, the concentration meter will fill up. All this does is allow your judgment cuts to deal more damage, and if it's level 3, you can perform Virgil's ultimate attack, which looks sick as hell. I find this to be a cool idea on paper, but in execution, it's not something that you really need to pay much attention to. Virgil is already an insanely powerful and fast character without the concentration meter, so its inclusion feels like a haphazard way to make the character feel like he has more depth than he actually does. Virgil is a character that you pick to fulfill a power fantasy rather than one to test your technical know-how. That's not to say that he isn't fun or lacking any depth, but it doesn't take much effort to make Virgil the most powerful character in the game. Lady and Trish, on the other hand, are a bit of a weird case. Lady has a very unconventional fighting style when compared to the other characters in this franchise. She focuses entirely on using firearms in combat. While she does have a couple of melee attacks, the main appeal to Lady is her guns. Of course, she has access to her trademark Kalina on rocket launcher, but she also has her magnums and shotgun. All of her weapons can be charged up, which not only makes them more powerful, but some weapons even get bonus effects. Instead of having a traditional devil trigger, Lady has access to explosives that deal area of effect damage. The strength of which is determined by the number of DT gauges she has filled up at the time of activation. Lady's a character that I like a lot in concept, but in execution, she isn't that fun to play as. Her fighting style inherently encourages a more campy approach to combat. Fully charging the Kalina on and letting loose on a group of enemies does far too much damage for its own good, and since her DT meter fills up faster with charge shots, the game low-key encourages this. I appreciate the effort in making the only human character in the series playable, but I just don't really rock with her playstyle. On the flip side, however, I really like playing as Trish. What sets her apart from the other characters is that her moveset is determined by whether or not she has the sword Sparta thrown out. Trish also has access to her own version of Pandora, which costs a certain amount of her Devil Trigger gauge to use. Much like Virgil, Trish is disgustingly overpowered. You can throw out Sparta whenever you want, and while it does stay out for a limited time, there's no cooldown to this attack. Trish's bare knuckle attacks do a lot of damage, especially her combo that ends with real impact, so it's a viable strategy to just spam it over and over. Her sword game is also nothing to scoff at, since one of her attacks is a great way to clump a group of enemies together so you can blast them away with Pandora. It's fun to play as Trish, but it doesn't take a lot of skill to execute these powerful commands. There was an attempt to give her most powerful moves a resource, but it doesn't really matter all too much when she's just naturally strong. The inclusion of these characters in Special Edition are a nice novelty. They can certainly add some extra playtime to the overall package if you like the skill sets they provide. However, these extra characters honestly highlight just how rushed the game's main campaign is more than anything. In a game that already requires you to backtrack through every level, it might be a bit too much to ask for you to do it two more times for the sake of trying everyone out. Virgil has it especially bad since unlike Lady and Trish, you don't swap to another character halfway through, so you're quite literally playing the same levels twice and fighting the same bosses three times with no differences. At the very least, you can use every character in the returning Bloody Palace mode if you want a change of pace, though I'm not terribly big on the changes made to it. In case you need a reminder, Bloody Palace is essentially the game's horde mode. You fight and defeat waves of enemies with the occasional boss battle sprinkled in for good measure. In DMC3, there were almost 10,000 floors to clear out, though you only had to do about 100 rounds minimum due to the way that mode was set up. DMC4 cuts it down to 101 floors, but instead asks you to compete against a time limit. With every kill on an enemy, you gain some extra time on the clock. You even get a 30 second bonus for finishing the floor without taking any damage. I'm not too big on the time limit if I'm being honest. In DMC3, I like to use Bloody Palace as a way to practice against specific enemy formations or to refine my Royal Guard skills. Because of the inherent design of 4's Bloody Palace, I can't waste too much time experimenting without risking running out the clock. Bloody Palace in this game encourages efficiency more than anything, which I kinda think misses the point of the franchise. Devil May Cry was always a game about showing off more than anything thanks to the inclusion of the taunt mechanic and the style meter. 
while your clear time was an important factor to your end stage rank in the main game, it's generous enough to let you show off in most encounters. Bloody Palace, on the other hand, doesn't really care about that, and is instead constantly rushing you, which means if I want to play as Dante in Bloody Palace, I can't waste too much time trying to practice Royal Guard releases or refining my weapon switching. Of course, I could always just do that in the main campaign if I really wanted to, but DMC3 let me practice in Bloody Palace, so I don't quite see why this game doesn't. It's still a fun mode since it challenges you in a slightly different way than the main story does, but I prefer the way it's handled in 3. As a whole, I like Devil May Cry 4. I know that might come as a bit of a shock considering how critical I was throughout this video, but despite the issues I take with it, it's undeniable that the game has a lot of great qualities. Nero is a fun character to play as, and offers his own unique take on the combat system, even if he does get a little stale. Dante's combat has a lot more freedom and depth thanks to the more powerful hardware. While on the surface he has fewer weapons and styles, the game makes up for it by giving you access to your entire arsenal at once. The amount of options in any given scenario is staggering, and it feels like Dante can do literally anything. At the time of DMC4's release, you weren't getting another action game that offered the same level of player expression as this one had. Sure, even back then, a lot of people criticized its less savory aspects, but there were plenty of people that were willing to look past those faults, and I was one of them. This was my first Devil May Cry game, and it made me a fan of the series. It convinced me to go back and try out the other titles, and while I had my fun with them, I always came back to this one. I spent countless hours replaying the game over and over, to the point where my friends were probably sick of hearing me talk about it. I will always appreciate the good times that this game brought me in both my teenage years and early adulthood, and I had a great time revisiting the game for this video. However, now that we live in a post-Devil May Cry 5 world, DMC4 now exists in a bit of a weird position. Without going into too much detail, DMC5 expands on the ideas in 4, introduces even more mechanics and systems on top of that, and most importantly of all, feels like a complete package. In short, I think DMC5 kinda makes this game obsolete. Which is something that I can't say about the other games in this series aside from 2. DMC3 has plenty of unique weapons and styles exclusive to that game, and nowadays comes with the option to use the style switching mechanics introduced in DMC4. The original game even has some merit since it's so radically different from its successors. The only reason I can think of for someone to play DMC4 nowadays is to mess around with some of its niche mechanics, such as guard flying and DT distortion. We can also toss in its two unique weapons as well as Lady and Trish and Special Edition, even though I'm I'm not a huge fan of one of them. If you're a hardcore fan of the series, then that might sound great to you, but it's a hard sell for the more casual player base, who might just see this as a direct downgrade from the newest game in the series. The passage of time hasn't been very kind to this game. It's inarguable that DMC4 was a huge step forward for the series at the time, but now that it's been surpassed by a new entry, it's not hard to see why this game nowadays is only known as the Devil May Cry that tragically went unfinished. And I don't think that this is a legacy that anyone wants to live with. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I'd like to give a special shout out to all of my channel supporters whose names are on screen now. It's because of these lovely people that I'm able to make videos at the pace I do currently. These videos take a while to make, so if you're at all interested in helping out and donating, you can do so through my Patreon or channel memberships. I have a few things I can offer in return, such as early video access, a special Discord role, and even some behind the scenes content on occasion. Every donation helps, and if the rewards I mentioned sound at all interesting to you, then you can find out more by following the links in the description. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my good friend Josh from Trash or Treasure for editing this video. Having an editor helps a lot when it comes to multitasking, so hopefully I'll be able to get videos out on a more consistent rate with him on board. Josh also makes videos of his own, and I highly recommend you check out his channel and show him some support. If you like my stuff, then you'll definitely like his. In terms of future projects, the next video is going to be on Soul Hackers 2. The release of that game is just around the corner, and I plan on making a video on it not too long after it comes out. I also plan on talking about Neo The World Ends With You, as well as the rest of the Devil May Cry games sometime soon. I might even make a video on the first Bayonetta game since Bayonetta 3 comes out in October. It would be a good change of pace to talk about another action game series, don't you think? If you want to stay up to date with that and other upcoming videos, then I encourage you to follow my Twitter and join my Discord server. Both will be linked in the description. Once again, I'd like to thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you all next time.